This episode of the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show is brought to you by Squarespace, the beautiful and intuitive website publishing platform that allows anyone to create professional web pages, blogs, online stores, and galleries on a single platform. Let's say, for example, you want to make a fan site for Nickelodeon's game show, Guts. Squarespace, perfect way to do that. You start, you just pick one of Squarespace's award-winning designs, you add images, maybe your Guts fan art, maybe some screen captures of memorable Guts moments, you can drop in your Guts fan fiction, and then you can also use the website for e-commerce. You can actually sell, you know, your homemade Guts jewelry, those bootleg pieces of the aggro crag that you've been passing off as real and selling for years, and all Squarespace accounts come with 24-7 support, as well as cloud hosting and real-time analytics so you can see exactly how many people are on your Guts website. I'm going to tell you what, just because you're listening to the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show, here is a deal. Go to squarespace.com slash Jeff Rubin, enter the promo code DORK, and you will get a free two-week trial as well as 10% off whatever you do end up purchasing. And you don't have to use that code to make a Guts website. You could make a Legends of the Hidden Temple website, you could make a Double Dare website, or... It doesn't have to be about Nickelodeon at all. That's kind of what's fun about it. It's up to you to have an idea. Squarespace is just going to help you bring that idea to life. Start your website for free today at squarespace.com slash Jeff Rubin, promo code DORK. And now, here's the episode. Everybody. Welcome to Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show. Today on the Skype and phone, I am talking to a lovely woman who is a comedian, has done a lot of voiceover work, but is perhaps best known as the referee for Nickelodeon's game show, Guts. Before we say hello... Let's listen to a clip. Mike, each of our players will pull themselves across the pool and back. They must high-five the spotter before coming back and also to end the race. Best time wins. Guys, fire up those rapids. All right, we're getting there the water in the pool. On your mark, get set. Please, everyone, a big Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin show welcome for Moira Mo Quirk. Welcome to the show, Mo. Hello. Thank you very much for having me. It is so exciting just throwing to Mo right off the bat already. Already, it's the uh, it's electric in here. <laughs> uh, let's let's start from the beginning. I mean, I think the first thing I've been wondering for years: where exactly are you from? I am from the smallest county in England, uh, the county of Rutland. It's right in the middle of England. It was quite bucolic. What was your life like pre guts? What happened before you got on guts? Oh. Um, I, I was a, a schoolgirl and then a university girl and then I decided to come to America and be an, um, seeing an America girl. And I had just been in, in, uh, I'd come to visit, I had a grandmother in Florida and so I came to visit her, uh, you know, just for a few weeks, sure, sure. which became forever, um, and and then just started uh, working around and about. I was doing improv at the theatre there and working the theme parks and doing plays and, and just sort of becoming Americanized, I suppose. That's what we do over here. Yes, I assimilated. So did you have it in your mind that you wanted to be a comedian? Did you want to be an actress? Did you not really know? Yeah, I'd always I'd always been a performer and uh, and um, my degree was in, you know, drama in English and I'd, I'd gone to Central School um, in London. And so, but actually <laughs> after that, I got a bit burned. I didn't really enjoy Central School so much. I think they took the joy out of it for me. So... I, I was all ready to be like a, an archivist or a librarian or something. Um, and, and then I, I came, I was in Orlando and, and opportunities for performing started coming my way and, and it, it started to make me happy again. I think I needed to get out of the academic performance side of it. So before Guts, where you work, and Guts, I'm assuming, I believe, as I recall, was filmed at Nickelodeon Studios at yes. Universal Studios Florida. In Orlando, Florida. But did you work, um, did you work performance jobs besides Guts at the theme parks down there? Yes, yes, I did. I did, um, I did uh, improv uh, over at Epcot. And, and What kind of improv needs to be done at Epcot? At Epcot, <laughs> I don't know. God, it was so long ago, and I was so young. Um, I was very fresh-faced and naive. I was always a naive young thing. Um, 
Yeah, there would just be sort of audience participation shows where it would be silly renditions of Romeo and Juliet and stuff like that. And I also worked at Universal Studios. That was I was mostly there actually in doing um a sh- there was a show called Murder She Wrote Mystery Theater. Ooh. And it, and it was about just sort of the post-production process in film, you know, with Universal being a, a film theme mm-hmm. park. Mm-hmm. That was their theme. And so I I did that and it was actually that was a really lovely introduction to sort of being a working professional because I was with a lot of people. I was the youngest one there. I was just, you know, barely out of college. And I was with a lot of people from regional theatre who had a good 20, 10, 20, 30 years on me um, and were very kind and showed me the ropes. Was that fun, working at the theme parks? Um, yes, it was. It was a pretty cake job. But it is a job, I think, it's prob- it was good for me. It's a good starting out job. And it's also a good uh, once you've had your life and you want to be settled kind of job. So it was something that I could do for a little while, but then needed to, you know, go off and explore and be 20 and have my 20s. And is that when you ended up on Guts? Yeah, well, you know... You- Universal Studios and Nickelodeon Studios were basically the same lot and the only thing that you could audition for, um, there would be a few commercials, a few voiceovers. I mean, it's a very regional place or was at that time. Um, And so basically the only auditions that you could get were for Nickelodeon. So most of my friends who were working in TV or got TV jobs would be on Nickelodeon shows, whatever was going on right then. Um, and so I had done Clarissa. I think that might have been my first on-camera role, was playing someone. I was mutton dressed as lamb on that one. When you are a 20-something person and you have a spot on Clarissa Explains It All, do you watch other episodes of Clarissa Explains It All? Are you familiar with the show? I was familiar with the show. I don't know how or why, though. I guess it was just sort of part of the um, ethos there, so I knew of it, and I guess I had watched it to prepare for it as well do you remember what role you played on clarissa i was a poetess Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) i was a poetess who had won a competition um and it was just a little guest role i did my thing i think i wore a beret uh as a poetess would and black uh and 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 pontificated that was a cool show clarissa was like uh there weren't a lot of girls like her on tv at the time there weren't a lot of shows on nickelodeon being carried by girls and that was that was a good show yeah, it it was, and it was nice to have a female protagonist heading up a show, and and to have a, a friendship with a boy, and 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 all that kind of stuff. And did that lead to the audition for Guts? I think then they knew me, and so um, I, I guess everyone in Orlando was sent out for that audition, um, and so they did know me, um, roughly. I guess I. I'm often asked, how did you get the role of Guts? And it still perplexes me because if you were to ask me now, I would say, I don't know. It just seemed completely wrong for the role. I remember actually during the audition making a reference to Dostoevsky and uh, Albie Hecht, who was the um, executive producer, going, hmm, might be a bit heady for a sports show. Not that I'm an intellectual or anything like that, um, I don't mean that, but um, I'm not sporty. So w- w- what was that audition <laughs> like? Like, what were you doing at the Guts audition? Oh, goodness. They had me come back several times, actually. So the first time, I, I hope that you're amazed by my um, my ability to recall this, as it was several years ago. But I think for my first audition, and I was such an idiot, I turned up in, like, shorts and a T-shirt. <laughs> Um, and uh, and a baseball cap and they told me just don't wear a cap because obviously you can't see my face if I'm wearing a hat but um, I had to just do some play-by-play of the Elastic Jungle if you recall Mm-hmm. Um, so it, yeah, so I did play by play of that. The Elastic Jungle was just like chords going every which way, and kids had to kind of fight their way through those chords and get from one end to the other. Yes, it was uh, it was a maze of Bungie. Oh. It was a tribute to Bungie, mm-hmm. and then they had me come to the sound stage, which was all set up with some of the events. The pool was there, and they had the stunt people trying stuff out, and then they had me do play by play to real live right there people. 
Um, and then I think I might have come back a third time so that um, Brown Johnson could meet me. Who was Brown Johnson? She was like a big high up, like the emperor of Nickelodeon at the time. And yeah, she she wondered if people would understand me saying basketballs instead <laughs> of ba- basketballs. But um, yeah, so I I guess I passed muster and then and then I started doing it and I met Mike um, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> was amused by him. Yeah, you know, I watched some guts to prepare for this chat. Oh my goodness. It was really fun. It really held up. And Mike is calling every event like it is the ninth inning of the World Series. Yeah. And it's it's good. I, I, I'm not making fun of him. It, it's amazing, his enthusiasm that he brings to it. it. It really is a big part of the show. Yes. All right, so all three players at once trying to fight their way through that river. And it looks like Tabitha way out in front, followed by Stephanie. And then Tommy making it through the jungle fight. Tommy's in first place in this event. Tabitha. No, Tabitha's in first place. It looks like Stephanie, then Tommy. Tommy going in into the Savello. Oh, oh, and Tabitha falls at the finish line, but gets up and across. It looks like Stephanie. Was he like that in real life? He is really a dynamo. He is a very, very um, driven person. Um, and he's a good guy. He really is. Um, and no, we have not banged. Uh, people always, I'm just going to say that because that's always the first question he gets. That was not on my list of questions, I have to admit. But I'm glad we got it out there. We covered it. And I, I finally, he he had, he had he and I had talked once and I just said, oh, tell him, Mike. Tell him you did. Tell him you did and that you were the best I ever had. Just tell him that. It's, it's interesting you say driven because that's what I get from watching that. Like oh, yeah. He is going pedal to the metal at all times on yes. Guts. Like It is the most exciting. And it is exciting. Yeah. But he like, has more enthusiasm than people calling you know, more traditional sports. Yes. And I think I, to give him his due, he was doing what our executive producer wanted. I think, I think it's great. I, I love it. I, I mean, I, yeah. I can't stress enough how like I'm not making fun of him. And I, I was yeah. really... You know, I, I never it never bothered me as a kid, but going back and watching it as an adult, I uh, I recognize what a great performance both of you have. It's, you know, it's in the way impressive you, yeah. that he could do that, and he 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 gave it his all, and he did. <laughs> he was tired at the end of the day, I think. Let's let's take a step back for a second, because some people might be listening. We're almost fifteen minutes in now, ten minutes in. And uh, maybe they don't know what Guts is for some reason. Maybe they were in one of those poor households that didn't have Nickelodeon growing up Uh, for whatever reason. Or homeschooled or something. One of those abusive parents who just won't let their kids have cable. Uh, How would you describe Guts? It was described to me as um, a sports action show for kids where they got to do sort of fantastical sports. Um, And then probably off the record, it was described as a kid's variation of uh, American Gladiators. That's exactly how I would describe yeah. it, too. Yeah, uh, Which is cool. What, what And what was your role on the show? I was to be the referee. And I think the the voice of, of reason, it, it sort of turned out. <laughs> to Mike's insanity. Yeah, I always felt like, because I'd gotten hired for being really quite, comedic and I think I'd made Albie our our executive producer and everybody laugh because I came at it with a sort of more comedic perspective but I always felt that I was quite school marmish on the show and very serious and so yeah if ever people do tell me oh you were funny then I'm always surprised well watch again this isn't something I picked up on watching the show as a kid but when I watched it yesterday it seemed to me like you guys were doing um, you were kind of the straight man in the routine because yes. Mike yes. is going crazy. He's yelling. It's the it's coming down to the wire. Is, is he going to make the basket? Let's go to the yeah. remote. And then you very calmly bring yeah. us back to reality. You've, you're reporting the facts. You're reading the score. Yes. The Tiger at the top. Punch it in. The first. We're going for a silver medal now. Will it be CIS or Portugal for the silver? Purple. And then blue. Oh, what a finish. Let's go to Mo. In first place on the super aggro crank, Rachel from the UK. Were you actually refereeing any of the events or were you just wearing the shirt? Some stuff I would referee um, and, and I would have to blow a whistle and, and call stuff. Other times I always had, I will, 
I always had people to help me because it was a, spread across quite a large arena. Yeah, it's a hell of a set. Yeah, so I, I had people, there were generally, there was generally, um, I had Doug Greif, who would always help me and be on the floor with me and, um, and someone else. There was a guy named Jim Buss one year. And I remember that name because he just sent me a photo on my Facebook. So I, I was helped, definitely. And, and especially with, I didn't have to add very much either. And was that difficult at any point, like watching them and trying to do Oh, of course. Cool. Sometimes I didn't know what the hell was going on. And I just relied on other people because I sometimes had to be um, on a particular position. So yeah, sometimes it was just like, whatever, just tell me what happened and I'll say it. And I want to get back to something we were just saying a minute ago about you being this, this straight man. Did you realize that? You said that you you, you felt like um, you, you weren't doing exactly what you thought you were going to do when you showed up. Did you like you, you feel like that role developed for you? I think I think there was one time. Well, like I obviously, I mean, I realized pretty quickly that this this is my role, and just to be able to. The other reason I got hired was because I could remember things very um, quickly. Because a lot of times the rules would be given to me a minute before, and then I would have to turn around and just say them. Right, it was right. Just right. it was just that quick. And you're also uh, in front of a live crowd. Like this is somewhat a facsimile of a stadium. There's people there watching. Yes. Um. So I imagine there's a lot of pressure to you know recite the rules of this event perfectly. You don't get take after take after take to recite this game's weird set of rules. No, I would always be the one who looked like the doofus if I got it wrong. There was never going to be um any going back to do it again for my dignity. <laughs> there was not much dignity at all. Um, yes, and it also, I mean, we had to keep it going for the the crowd, the arena crowd. They were generally pulled from the theme parks. They're just like tourists. Yeah, they were tourists and they wanted to get back to their rides because they paid a lot of money to get into Universal. Right, right. So uh, they wanted their money's worth plus a Nickelodeon show for the kids. Going back to the refereeing, and I'm sorry I'm jumping around a lot, like, were there any events that you, you particularly liked? Like you had a favorite event to referee and to watch and to be a spectator of? Or did you like the elastic sports or the pool sports? Um, there was one particular one that I did like. I liked anything that m was comical to me. Um, <laughs> that was one where they had to um, like grab a football. There was a lot of American footballs coming down and they were um, attached to elastic and it would pull them back. And if they stretch too far forward it would just yank them back uh and to me i loved that game i don't know what it was called um yeah but i loved that one and there was another one and this one made me laugh because we'd had a um a meeting afterwards i don't think albie had been quite happy with um how the sets or whatever how things had been moved and so he was talking with his art director byron and uh and Byron just got a little irritated. He's well, because Albie said, "Well, what's going on? Why isn't it moving?" And and Albie was and Byron was just like, "Well, we've got to set this up and put this over here, and we've got to scatter some leaves." And uh, and I think I lost it right then that there would be something so important in a sporting arena about scattering some leaves. Do you know who was responsible for coming up with these games? Was that like a writer? I do not know, but I do know. I will give the um, art production and the productions, whatever you call it, the artistic side of it, huge props. They they did amazing stuff. The guys who built the Agro Crag and the guys who put it together, um, and Byron, is it Howard? I can't remember his last name. He was an amazing guy. He was really, really creative. I was, again, watching this yesterday. Um, there was one event in particular where the kids are in the pool mm. and there's five tubes between them and the other end of the pool and they have to get to one end and like pick up all the tubes and then get back to the other end like in with all the tubes around their body and I really like that event because it struck me as the kind of thing that if you just kind of left kids to their own devices and gave them 15 tubes to play with it seemed like the kind of game kids would just make up on their own. You know, like, I can imagine the kids being like, okay, the game is you got to get all the tubes around you. And all the kids had, like, different strategies for how to right. move. So it wasn't, like, a test of, like, who can throw a football the furthest, who's practiced the most with football. It was, like, a little bit of creativity and, like, a, but a little bit of strategy. just general athleticism. And, yes, yeah, strategy. Yeah. So the, the games uh, were, seemed fun and, and innovative and not like something you see anymore. So I, I was very impressed. 
We yeah. do, of course, have to talk about the aggro crag. Just a, a legend. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned the, you know, how impressive the people that put it together was. That thing is legendary. People that grew up with that show, like me, they still <laughs> talk about it. How big was the aggro crag? Because, like, as a kid, it seemed enormous. And even watching it yesterday as an adult, I thought it seemed pretty big. It, it was big. Um, I don't know. It filled the end of the sound stage. So I don't know. If you're familiar with a sound stage, it would fill an end of one. But that looked like a really big sound stage, or is that just the way they shot it? It was. It was a pretty big sound stage. I think it was the biggest one on the on the Universal lot. Yeah. Did you yourself ever get to climb the Agro Crag? I did. Oh my god! I think Mike and I did it both. Yeah. Is it fun? Is it hard? Yeah, it was more. Well, obviously, my stakes weren't that huge, um, and I laughed because there's like places where the ground was really sort of squashy and and the art department guys were like throwing bits of mylar at me and the whatever it is foam rubber rocks um but, but yeah it it would it would have been challenging especially with uh, all of the smoke and whatnot yeah and, and the pressure yes the pressure you were the person that got to explain i mean you explained every event but you explained the aggro crag every episode players will start at the sound of my whistle each player has an identical side of the mountain to climb and may not cross into another player's path now during their climb they must light up each of seven targets located on their side of the crag the first player to set off all the targets including the final one at the peak of the mountain will receive first place points Do you just like wake up and you're sleeping sometimes explaining how the aggro crag works i suppose i don't know if i i have to ask my husband if i ever recite it in my sleep i do remember that i got called on it because i've got a very midlands sort of accent and so i'd always say crag there was there's just the way i said crag always sounded a bit ugly and not and not what uh, my drama school would have liked something i saw in the episode i watched yesterday and it like really activated a part of my brain oh my goodness you are so up on your episodes and to me it's a blur well i watched two episodes of guts yesterday and you know i watched it as a kid and i watched it a lot in college too so like i'm i'm reasonably familiar with guts i gotta that say is something i learned that it was not just for kids but that college boys watched it too i've got no understand why would college kids watch it do you think i don't know that's i mean we had a lot of time ready access to drugs <laughs> And I don't know. I mean, there's a bit of nostalgia to it, too. It's silly. It's fun. It's a sense of silliness to it that I liked. Yeah. So something I noticed yesterday, and I remember it happening all the time after I saw it once, kid missing the actuator on the way up. So on yep. the way up the mountain, you got to hit seven, I believe it was, actuators, which are just like little podiums. Buttons. Yeah. All the time, you see these kids missing an actuator, and it pretty much cost them the game because then they got to double back and get it. You're almost out at that point. Yeah. Why do they always miss the actuators? This is like... Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with other Nickelodeon game shows. The Shrine of the Silver Monkey was the thing that always messed up kids on Legends of the Hidden Temple. <laughs> we And I've talked to Kirk Fogg on the show, and we, we got to the bottom of that one. Do you know why kids were always missing the actuators? I've got no idea. I've got no idea. And the thing is that there was always a stunt person just pointing at it, going, hit it, hit it, hit it. And, um, yeah, I think we probably had one girl miss all of them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that sounds possible i kind of remember that yeah it's just like oh there's the top i better get there i i have no idea i it is not something that i did and experienced in that respect mm -hmm, who mm -hmm. knows let's it, leave that a mystery shall we it is interesting though like you know you were talking about like the pressure and you're on tv one thing that's unique about guts even other nickelodeon game shows is that there's no final prize at the end except you get a trophy you get a glow and peace of the aggro crack. Yes. But, but, you know, if you want Double Dare, your family won a vacation. When you won a Legend of the Temple, you won, I don't know, a stereo or whatever the prize was in the late 80s. Right. But Guts, no prize. Really, it's all about glory. Yes, it was about that. And I think that was um, Albie's main aim. I remember trying to tell somebody during a um, an interview at the time that it was, it was a very post-80s thing. Like, the 80s was all about acquiring... <clears throat> and the 90s maybe would have been a bit more about some, you know, <laughs> I don't know, making amends for that. But um, the only other show, what was the other show I did? that I would do Figure It Out sometimes. Oh, uh, I don't remember. I definitely know Figure It Out. Mike O'Malley hosted that one too. 
He didn't host that one. Someone oh, said, what am I? Oh, yes, yes. I'm wait, thinking wait. of uh, Get the Picture with Michael Malley. Right, right. Figure it out to one with Summer Sanders. I'm so sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, no worries. Um, Were you a panelist on Figure It Out? Yeah, I was a panelist several times. Oh, the first time uh, they had to get me ready in five minutes and some lady put makeup on me that made me look like a pumpkin. It was awful. And Figure put, It Out, for those that don't remember, was yeah. another Nickelodeon game show where they had people from other Nickelodeon shows like yourself, uh, yes. uh, the kids from Pete and Pete, the kids from all that, and yeah. they would, it was like, um, there's another game show that's like, um, to tell the truth yeah. almost, you'd have to try to guess what the person on stage, yeah. what their talent was. What their talent was or what special thing they had done. But I have to say, like, the the prize on Nickelodeon was that you got to part. I mean, on, on Guts was that you got to participate, and then if you won, you got this trophy, the Agro Crag trophy. Um, on Figure It Out, it seemed like they were taking bits of set from shows that were finished and uh, and just giving those away. It seemed like the most rubbish prizes you could possibly get. Figure It Out was kind of weird because the contestant wasn't you. It was the person who had the talent. And there wasn't really anything they could do uh, to win. There was no strategy. You just sat there while yourself and the other panelists tried to guess what their talent was. And if you couldn't guess it, they would win. But there was yes. nothing they could do to like directly control that. It is true. And so in 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 some respects, I would say how the show failed for me. Um, not entirely, but this was a, a, a detracting point, was that then there would be no sort of um, friendship or whatever between the the panel and the person playing because they didn't want you to guess. Mm -hmm. So some of the some of the uh, contestants on that one could get a bit bolshy, mm. or they'd just give you the stink eye. Was that fun to be on that show? It always looked like it was fun. Did it? Look yes, it was fun. I I just remember being hurriedly thrown there, and I also remember too that one time I had to taste something. It was like you know, put a blindfold on and taste mm -hmm. something. The clue, the clue, what was it? The clue patrol or something? The clue brigade? Oh my goodness, that was it. When they would just completely mime out the answer in the, like most, a in the most patently obvious way ever. There's like a ton of people listening to this right now that are shouting out what the what it actually was. Really frustrated that neither of us can remember. Um, I'll think about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It'll like come, like I'll wake up in the middle of the night and be yeah. like, if I, I get any, if I get any comments on my Facebook or my Twitter about what it was, I will be annoyed with you. So don't. <laughs> Um, I can hardly deal with it as it is. Um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, they made me um, stick my finger in some product and taste it, and it was ranch dressing, and there's nobody who detests mayonnaise more than me. So I was, I was a bit miffed about that, actually. I said, don't make me taste things that are gross. <laughs> Did you ever get slimed when you were on oh, Figure It Out? Oh, yes, on Figure It Out. It's the first thing that happened to me. What is it like getting slimed? Messy. It was a bit messy. Um, and I used to, because I did all sorts of uh, live shows as well, all across um, America. And uh, I would get slimed occasionally by um, uh, naughty kids doing that. Mostly we were meant to slime the kids, but they would get us. And then there was one event. What were, what were those live shows? That was just like a Nickelodeon live tour? Yeah. We would just go to various um, sports arenas and baseball fields and malls and things and, and do sort of double dare and uh, various sorts of games. Were those fun? Games. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that. I got to um, see some different parts of America and I always traveled with some great people. Yeah. I think we got a few steps away now because we start talking about figure it out. Yeah. You know, you, st you bring up any Nickelodeon show, we're going to go down a rabbit hole or two. Yeah. But I want to get back to that idea of how Guts had no prize. And you were saying that figure it out was another show where um, it, it was more about the glory. Figure it out. No, they had prizes. Oh. I simply considered them crappy prizes. Right, right, right. That, that was my <laughs> answer to that one. But for Guts, it was a deliberate decision to make it more about the honor and the competition, almost like the Olympics. I think so. I think so, yes. Yeah. And I think it kind of had that side effect of like making that trophy a legendary prop. Like That's something people still talk about, oh, still really goodness. remember. You do not even know how many emails and whatever whenever people see me that's the first how do i get that well you can't right i mean is that, my answer that i want to yeah. talk about why we can't but that i think that goes to show like you know double dare where they just gave away 
again, just a, a family vacation. No one sees Mark Summers and is like, hey, give me $500 or whatever. But the, the, <laughs> yeah. the Arrow Crag was like really a, a piece of that show. And why can't we have any? They, I'm assuming we just don't. They just don't exist anymore. Well, no, they were made by the art department. Mm-hmm. Just like one per episode. Yeah. I had a friend that would check eBay just like every few months or so. Uh, you know, always always having his eye out. But you know, if you, that's not something you're ever going to give away if you win it. No, and my husband always says, "Well, you know, if ever we want to put an addition on the house, maybe we put ours on eBay." That's funny. So you yeah. you do have one though. I do have one, and it's all got a little plaque on it dedicated to me. Oh, that's so um, nice. It was my giveaway. Well, yeah, it's been in the garage forever. I think we we got it out last year for some guy. It was, we've been showing it to people because a lot of the comics that I work with are in their twenties and thirties, so they want to see it. Did you, you mentioned that you have kids. Are your kids old enough to watch Guts? Do they know what the aggro crag is? No, they they know that I worked on Nickelodeon, but it's me, so they don't really care. Does that get you any credit <laughs> with your kids that you were on a kids network, that you were on Nickelodeon? No, no, yeah. it, gets, it gets me no credit whatsoever. Um, I'm trying to think what has gotten me credit with them. I think when I, I worked with um, Kenneth Branagh, doing um, some voiceover job and I did get to come home and say hey I worked with Gilderoy Lockhart today and that was finally I got some love on that one and it's funny that I, I was like Kenneth Branagh why, why are your kids excited about Kenneth Branagh I, I Gilderoy figure... Lockhart right, right, right. Big, big Harry Potter fans of course did you ever get to deal with the kids or maybe it's did you ever have to deal with the kids on Guts um I would chat with them and they could always come and say hi and stuff. And, and um, I dealt more with the parents because they, they would be done. And lots of the parents were lovely and, and some of them weren't. Yeah, I've been on some sets like film shoots with kids and <laughs> I, like the kids are great, always fun. Usually fun, anyway. Yeah. But the parents are where you got the parents are where you get run into trouble, in my experience. Well, there would be. Yeah, it wasn't so much like that because I, I know what you're talking about of dealing with with um, like performance parents, but um, there would be some parents who were like, "So is that what you're gonna be? You're gonna be a loser? You're gonna be a loser?" Oh no, really? Yeah, that's the saddest say, thing I've ever heard. It is this, and I I walked to my dressing room like, "Oh my goodness, that's awful!" I felt that ruined my day. And I'm not even that kid. Can you believe that? There's not even a prize on the line. or like It's not even like the family's going on vacation if he wins or this anything. This dad just reading his kid the riot act oh my but, God. You know, before lunch. Did you feel like you had a responsibility? Does anyone on Guts have a responsibility to be like, hey, dad, cool it. We're all just having fun. It's Guts. This is like elastic well, basketball. It's not a real well, thing. Well, you can, but I imagine if that's their demeanor out in public or surrounded by people who they know would not think that cool, then... What are you going to do but hope that that kid overcomes that and becomes a kindly and caring and compassionate person? Something I did notice, again, watching the show as an adult, uh, a lot of sportsmanship among the kids. At least it looks that way. Lots of high five and shaking hands when things are over. Is that really how it went down? Or is that just the two episodes I watched? Um, Yeah, I mean, they behaved that way. But I think they were also guided toward it but i think sure. honestly there were so many kids that were just happy to be there though i do remember one girl who lost everything i think she came in third in every event and you couldn't have met anyone who was happier she was pleased as punch to be there she That's was up against nice. two boys who just kicked her kicked her down and she she didn't care i'm here i'm having a good time and then there would be... Um, that, that put me know. back up again. I was feeling down after the story about the dad exactly. yelling at his kid, but like now I'm back at neutral because that's, that's, I like hearing that. You know, if you, if you have a, a dad like that, I'm, I'm sure you overcome. So generally it seemed like the kids were having fun when they were on the show. I think so. And especially towards the, like the second and third and fourth seasons when they, when they knew what they were, ex, you know, they knew what to expect. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you ever have the opposite, though, where, like, a kid was just not having a good day and just broke down and started crying? Because sometimes you see that in, like, the Little League World Series, and it's kind of hilarious. So. Aw. Um, I don't recall. I'm sure that there were kids who broke down. And, yeah, there were also some kids who were complete butts. But what are you going to do? It's the real world, and there's all different personalities. And But mostly, I think they were having a good time. And then, of course, 
the last season, I believe the last season, one of the later seasons anyway, the show went global and it was global guts. It was. We had um, we had hosts from around the world. We had hosts from Germany and Portugal and Spain and Russia. And that's um, something I don't even remember. I remember global guts. But uh, again, I watched one yesterday and there was all the announcers from all the different countries. And that's not something I appreciated. That's really cool. That must have been very exciting. It was exciting and I got lots more time off. It was great. Did you do the English edition? Yes. So they had, uh, they kept Mike and me for when they started airing it in the UK and obviously for Australia as well, you know, all the English speaking lands. Um, but yeah, but there were some really lovely, I still remember Rolf from Germany. He was great. Um, yeah. And Israel, not Russia. I think it was Israel, Portugal, Germany, and Spain. Maybe Russia. Yeah, I think there was Russia. Someone from the Eastern Bloc kind of countries. Something I found myself wondering as I watched this show is uh, how come it's not still on today? It seems like the kind of thing they really could have done forever. Um, <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, I well, probably uh, not looks quite so svelte in my, uh, in my spandex anymore. Um, well, I'm sure that's not true. But even if it's not you, the <laughs> format is uh, like it's they, it's it's, they does, it's not dated. You know, like if you watch Clarissa oh. Explains It All, um, which is a wonderful kid show, it's dated. But uh, yeah. Guts is not like they, I, it, except for a few graphic elements and maybe the music here and there. Yeah, like, it could. It's very easy to imagine it well, still being do, on today. They did do a second round of it. There was a, a Guts family guts or whatever that they did a couple of years ago i think but it was but not it's nearly as successful i think as far as i can tell they just did a short run of it whereas you were yeah. on for what three or four seasons we did four seasons yeah what was the end like what happened um we said well done and then we got on with our lives jeff it, was it that easy yes and then <laughs> what do you think would happen i don't know think it would be like the end of mash and we all cried <laughs> out. we all just... got in a helicopter and Flew away. Maybe you just like blow up the aggro crag and then you have little pieces of it everywhere. That's... Oh, I don't know. I think, no, I think we all just took our Reebok and went home. But was it a situation where like you felt like, or, I don't know if maybe you just don't have any insight of it, but like did, were ratings dropping and the network was looking for something new or did you guys just feel like, you know, we've had enough of this. This is good. Oh, I don't know. No, I've got no idea. I've got no insight on that at all. I, it may be that people just had other projects they wanted to do. But then what did happen after they blew up the aggro crag? What have you done uh, since Guts? And this is really exciting too because it's something I'm also into. Yeah, after uh, that, my, my um, then husband, because I got engaged at the... The last season of Guts, um, I got engaged in down in Miami. And then um, my husband and I did a tour of Canada with a show that we had written and produced and then ended up in L.A. And then I started doing uh, voiceover once I was, was here. So now I work um, and have worked doing cartoons and games and audio books and radio plays. And so you don't see me anymore. Actually, you do see me. I, I just did a, um, a web series called Dirty Work. Um, and it won. This was the first year that they had um, new media in the Emmys. And it won the Emmy for best, for best web series. Yeah. I got to go back to some of those video games, though, because you've worked on some terrific games. You were a voice mm -hmm. in XCOM. Yes. Which I think, and I've talked about this on the podcast before, I think is maybe the best game of last year. Oh, really? And I didn't even realize as a Guts fan, that you uh, were this character. You're a pretty major character. Uh, do I, though That said, I can't remember her name. Do you, do you remember the character's name? For XCOM, that's um, Dr. Valens. She's like, basically, in XCOM, you are the commander of a multinational UFO defense program. Yes. And you have an engineering advisor who's like a gruffy old dude, and you have a science <laughs> advisor who is you. Yes, uh, that's me. And I'm very cold and clinical. Commander, with this research complete, my staff and I currently have nothing to study. I would like to ask your permission to autopsy the alien cadavers retrieved from your last two field operations. Do you play the game at all? Do I play the game? No. Do you know a lot about the game? Do they tell you about the character? Just what? What is that process like? No, they're they're really cool about. Um, I I like working with with um 
that particular group. Um, uh, there's a guy named Jack who who directs me for those, and he'll do it via Skype, or sometimes he comes down to LA because they're just based up in Novato. And is that group the company that produces the game, or do they hire mm-hmm. another company? No, he's he's, he's with that company, and then mm-hmm. he comes down and and uh, and casts and directs. Um, yeah, and so I do that in a in a lovely little studio down in Santa Monica. Uh, I just went and did some more at the beginning of the year. They're adding some extras. Oh my god, that's yeah. amazing! I can't wait for that. It really, it's, it, it, I mean, do you even know that? Like, it's, it, do you have any idea, or does it matter to you? I'm sure it matters to you. That it's a great game. That people love that game. Oh well, that's no, that's good to know. I, I, I want it to be a good game, and I, I like, I'm sure, of you know, I like, I like being in quality. I was in, um, uh. Elder Scrolls Skyrim. Yeah, that's like arguably the biggest game of like this generation of consoles. Yeah, that won a bunch of, it was like one video game of the year award. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful to look at. And you you, you play like a character, uh, even more so than with an XCOM in Skyrim, you play a character who has an arc. Yes, I play Carlia. You're a clever girl, Carlia. Buying Golden Glow Estate and funding Haunting Brew Meadery was inspired. To ensure an enemy's defeat. You must first undermine his allies. It was the first lesson Gallus taught us. Who is Carlia? Because the thing about Skyrim, and I don't know if you know this if you've ever played the game, is it is enormous. Yeah. And you could play Skyrim for 80 hours and nothing against you. You might never run into Carlia. Oh, okay. You might never run into her. But she, she's she got a thing about Mercer. Uh, she's like, the th- she's well into the Thieves Guild. Um, and Brynjolf is her pal. And, uh, yeah, we we'll just play the game and make sure you find her. So what did they tell you about that character? Like, what, what kind of background do they give you on a character when you're recording a voice in Skyrim? Oh, my goodness. Well, that one, I do remember, because I, I read a, a lot of auditions. <laughs> Obviously, I don't get them all. Um, and so sometimes months will go by as well until you hear about something. Sometimes there's, a, like, a two-day turnaround, and sometimes it's weeks or months. And uh, But this one I actually remembered... And I remembered that sh- for the audition, they gave me a bunch of dialogue that wasn't actually used in the game, but she was to be gruff and have a, a certain vocal characteristic. And, uh, you know, she's a, she's been a bit burned. And so they wanted that to come over. So, yeah, with I, I imagine, I hope I brought some vulnerability and some meaning to her. But otherwise, once you get there, it is a you get the job done. You go in and you read your lines line by line. Because remember, you don't necessarily... They'll read what your um, emotions are at that point or what's preceded it, why you're responding in such a way. But you read all of your lines wild, which means it's just you... um, responding to your make-believe people. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And also, I imagine you're reading every possibility. Like, if you're doing a cartoon, um, and in this episode, the character goes on a quest, you read about the character going on a quest, but in Skyrim, you got to read what happens if the character dies, what happens yeah. if they buy something, what happens if they sell something, all these, like, what-ifs. So then, when, you, when you're doing your session, then they will stop and say, and this is why you're responding, this is this way this is what has happened this is what will happen this is what might happen and yeah so you have to have that explained to you that sounds like a lot of fun yeah. too yeah and it's funny because um for skyrim that was just done in one session but for other games you will go back and back for um star wars the old republic which i think came out pretty much the same time mm-hmm. that that was over a year I would go in and, and work on that. Interesting. Well, The Old Republic is like uh, an online game, and it's kind of in a state of constant development. So that might maybe that's why. Yes, and I and I just went in and did some more for that as well. Um, but but and also, I mean, it's just in an incredible cast of people. And it's huge. It's, I think they must have finally gotten to the point where they said. Um, are you English? Have you stood next to anyone English? Have you ever wanted a cup of tea? You'll do. Do you enjoy working on a video game more or less than a cartoon, or is it all fun in different ways? Yeah, it's all fun in different ways. I mean, obviously, I, I really liked Carlia because there was, there was something sort of hefty and meaty about her, mm-hmm. if you know mm-hmm. what I mean. Because um, sometimes in a cartoon, you're just 
saying, "Oh my goodness, I run out of ice cream," <laughs> and that's your and that's your job for the day. And other times you'll have amazing arcs. It, it just depends. Yeah, I I like it all. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it all. No, Skyrim is a very adult game. You know, where like they're like real <laughs> stories with these characters. And it seems like uh, that's an opportunity that probably, you know, to do serious voiceover probably is an opportunity that didn't exist 10 years ago. Well, it, it is funny how much it has changed and, and, and how if you ever did a demo probably 15 years ago, it would be filled with a lot of more sort of, of those Hanna-Barbera mm -hmm. sort of characters. And now you just have to go in there and be, I hate using this phrase, but real whatever your real is. And they just want a lot more of, it's much more cinematic acting now, I would imagine. It seems good though, because the other things still exist. They still make Hanna-Barbera-like cartoons. Yeah. But there's just uh, more types of cartoons, more types of animation uh, coming out, and exactly. more opportunities to yes. do different it's, things. It's, it's quite sophisticated now. Although that said, one of my favorite things that I did um, and that I get a lot of feedback on was an anime game called Haunting Ground or... Demento, it's got two different titles, whether it's Europe or here. That one I don't know. I played a girl um, named Daniela, and she was nuts. My creator said he made me the perfect woman, but I cannot taste or experience pleasure or feel pain. It was just crazy, off-the-wall nuts. She's like Mrs. Danvers times 100 nutty 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 with and just psychotic with a psychotic laugh and that that was really fun as well but do you ever wake up and you're just like man i wish i was just calling times on the aggro crag <laughs> i don't mean to disappoint you but no not really i i'd like progress i i that's one of the reasons that i like what I do is that and theatre in particular and, and this is that you get to do a lot of stuff and then it stops and there is a certain sadness in saying goodbye to people and a project stopping when you've enjoyed it but um, I like moving on and just having something new something new and shiny to play with and you also perform stand-up comedy, which I think we briefly mentioned once or twice. And that's something yes. where, like, you don't have to audition and you can just go out and do it, whatever. Well, kind of, yeah. You have to – you earn your um, place on the stage in a, in a different way. Right. Well, you can do uh, it whenever if you're not picky about the room. Yeah, I guess you could go to <laughs> – you could just start at, I don't know, the bar half fresh down the street if you wanted. Yeah, there is – I don't know if they still do it, but there is a taco restaurant in Midtown in New York that has an open mic in the basement. And I have been to it, and it is yeah. it is something. <laughs> I mean, it's not bad. And there's people there that are – there's absolutely people there who are, like, good comedians and are, like, you know, just yeah. getting started and looking for stage time or whatever. But, you yeah, know. Yeah, listen, I, I used to go to um, the end of the 90s or when I, when I first got to L.A., um, I used to go to a little coffee shop and uh, – I particularly loved seeing a certain guy named Zach Galifianakis mm -hmm. who would come out every week and do his stuff. And he was as amazing then as he is now. It just, you know, he just worked and worked and worked and got known and known and known. And now he's like the hangover guy. Right, right. Uh, plus, plus, I mean, he, much more than that. But yeah. So wherever you have to start and wherever you have to perform, but. It's, it's, it's the same thing of having to earn your place. Well, I think a lot of people are going to be excited to hear this because I know a lot of people are a fan of yours from back in the day, but I don't know that all those people know that they're still a fan of yours, that, they're like, that your work's still out there and that they probably enjoyed it. I'd say a lot of people listening to this podcast have at least a passing familiarity with Skyrim, uh, and they don't know that they've, uh, still, they're still enjoying their work. How can... Uh, is there anything we can plug? Like, how can people find your work? Oh, well, listen, I've been the worst at social media in, in perhaps the world, and, and my husband has reprimanded me severely, um, but I'm, I'm much better at it now. So you can find me, follow me on Twitter at Maura Quirkable. Someone took Maura Quirk, so I'm Maura Quirkable. Did the person that take Maura Quirk, is that actually a Moira Quirk, or is it like a novelty account where they're pretending to be you, calling I guts? Think that, I think they're pretending to be me. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of Facebook pages with fake me's as well. And I'm doing much better with my Facebook page. I prefer Twitter to Facebook. And uh, and I'm 
about to take my website down because it's from 2006 and uh, put something better and more up to date up. So definitely, yeah. Um, and YouTube as well. I have uh, the oldest, saddest YouTube uh site or whatever you call it but i i searched for your stand-up on youtube and i watched it it's there it's available and it's very funny oh good and that's something well, people can do yeah it was great i really enjoyed yeah. it and <laughs> also of course you could go on youtube you can look for guts it's pretty much all there yeah you can look for guts you can look for um uh, a web series i did season three of pretty the series which is a soap opera spoof uh that's won a lot of prizes and of course my emmy winning dirty work but I, I will warn people that I am ex- it, it's not for the faint of heart and I am so sweary in that one. Sweary, sweary, sweary pants. <laughs> that's the worst that's the worst curse in the movie. <laughs> you swear pants. Well, Mo, I've been a fan for a long time. Really exciting. Thank you so much for talking tonight. It's great to hear about all these details about how this stuff works. Oh my goodness, I can't even believe I remembered anything to tell you. I feel I feel the same way. I'm like, I can't believe I remembered anything to ask. But, you know, it's a good show. It's still there. Yeah, well, I'm glad to hear. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, Mo, thank you so much. This is great. You're very welcome, Jeff. Take care. Bye. The Charade Brigade. The Charade Brigade, that was the name of the team that would help the panelists on Figure It Out. Uh, Figure It Out. Glad we figured that out. Thank you to Mo for coming on the podcast and reminiscing. Now, as you may know, new Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin shows come out every Tuesday except the first Tuesday of the month, which means we are off next week. Now, don't worry. There will be a new bleep bloop on College Humor, and I have it on good authority that Sarah Schneider is going to be returning, making her triumphant return to Bleep Bloop for that episode. So I'm really looking forward to that. But the week after that, when the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show comes back on April 9th, you're going to want to circle that date on your calendar because on the next episode of the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show, we are going to be talking to a man who has sold more children's books than anyone except for J.K. Rowling. He created a little series called Goosebumps. Yes, that's right. On the next episode, my guest will be R.L. Stein, and here is what that's going to sound like. What made you decide to write for kids in the first place? Because it sounds like even when you were doing comedy, that was for kids. Everything I've ever done is an accident. Every, really, Jeff. Everything that ever happened to me. I came, I came to New York. I grew up in Ohio and came to New York to be a writer. I wanted to write adult humor novels. And I just happened to, you know, I had to work for I had to get a job and ended up at Scholastic. I was an editor at Scholastic, started writing for kids. And there I was. It just, you know, I always tell kids, you, you, you can't really plan your career. You can't know what's going to happen to you because so many accidents, there's so many twists and turns. And there I was writing for kids and an editor called me and said, I love your funny magazine. I'll bet you could write good children's books. And I thought, gee, I never thought about it. She said, let's have lunch and talk about doing some funny children's books. And that's how I got writing for kids. Everything you ever wanted to know about R.L. Stein will be revealed in two weeks on the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show. Until then, let's hang out on some social media sites. You know, that's what everyone's doing. You can find me on Twitter or Matt Jeff Rubin Show, on Tumblr at jeffrubinjeffrubin.com. I have a Facebook fan page, and there is youtube.com slash jeffrubinjeffrubin. R.L. Stein, April 9th. I'll see you there. Bye.